on the Lord's Day here on Sunday, we come again with heavy hearts. And it's very difficult for a lot of us. I mean, there are a lot of people who knew our beloved Ladika a lot more intimately than I could. And that really hurt me on Monday. And as I had shared, you know, I found a lot of healing and consolation praying with my brothers and sisters in Christ. So continue to pray for those who knew him more intimately, who really had a very close and personal relationship with him because they're still hurting. But here shortly today, we'll go there and we'll be able to have closure. And there's something beautiful about coming together as a whole, as the whole of the diocese coming together and rallying together. And that was kind of my, where I kind of realized, you know, we can see it as a sad thing. Obviously it is. The Metropolitan Illyrian is not here with us, but he's here with uh, with our Father in Heaven, and with Him. But I also kind of looked at it as a rallying point, especially with so many different things that are going on, and so many temptations to cause more divisions and schisms and all different kinds of things. And no, this this right now, everybody's put all these differences aside, and they're, they're coming together. And so that's what we need is healing. And the Church Fathers teach us that healing is at the heart of our salvation. And the role of the church is to bring God's healing to all of humanity, not just here, but to all of humanity. And most precious of all, that God has created the noetic and intelligent creature that is man has been made alone among created beings. And God's image and likeness, first every man is said to be made in the image of God as regards to the dignity of his intelligent and uh, rational soul and endowed with free will, St. John of Damascus. And in the Gospel account of Matthew, we read Jesus healing the blind man, along with many other acts of restoring humanity. And the Church Fathers teach that these healings are signs of our own spiritual need for healing, of our own spiritual blindness, of our own spiritual deafness to the Word of God. Meaning we should actually see ourselves as one of the infirm that Christ is healing. And we are all spiritually blind to one degree or to another. We are all blind because we do not allow God to work in our lives. We get in the way and take the path of least resistance. And the path of least resistance has nothing to do with Christ. We are called to carry our cross. And if we get out of the way and we allow God to restore us, then we begin to see. We begin to see our lives more clearly because we begin to see God more clearly because we allow him to actively work in us. And how does God allow us to see ourselves? Simply stated, Christ is the source of life, both the created and uncreated energies. He is light that darkness cannot hide itself from. And the early church father, Justin Martyr, taught that the Logos, the Word of God, is active throughout all of the universe. He used the term Logos to say that every teacher who spoke well and spoke truly throughout the world, world, world possessed part of the Logos, which is completely uh, gathered together in Jesus Christ. This is to say that the light of God shines and permeates, permeates kind of like coffee, you know, you get it going and you stir it up to get the good stuff out of the bean, so to say. Well, that's what he's trying to do in our lives spiritually speaking, but he also does this throughout the universe and is the foundation of everything that exists. If we know this to be true, why does humanity still think we can truly heal ourselves without God? Especially the human heart, which cannot be measured or cannot be contained. Because it is in the human heart that there are no boundaries. There are no limits, no preconceived notions of how we interact with God that we are not simply limited by the things of this world in order to know God. We go and we transcend those things. When we allow God to shine his light in our darkened lives and our darkened hearts, then we begin to see ourselves for who we truly are. When we allow God to shine his light into our darkened lives, it, it shows us the way home, home to him. The path of redemption, the path of salvation will be made more clear. So instead of an up and down road, a difficult journey, it doesn't have to be actually. If we find Christ and we find him to be the beacon of our light to guide us home, we can have a straight and direct path to him that's always ascending to the mountain of salvation, to God's immeasurable love for you, but for all of us. 
to truly be united to Christ. The more we allow God into our heart, he begins to expand the borders of our heart. So we think we're limited. No, we have the heart can grow and not move. In doing so, we find faith, faith that can move all mountains, a faith that will begin to restore our spiritual ignorance and blindness to our sins. Our senses will also begin to desire Christ as well. Sin will begin to taste bitter to us, and Christ will be the only true desire, the only true sweetness that we look to have in our life. The more we unite ourselves to Christ, we begin to see him more clearly, and we begin to see ourselves more clearly, and also, if we see God, we see our brothers and sisters more clearly as well, who are all made in the image of God and can also share in his uncreated light as well. Because that light, Christ the light, is the light that began it all. That is the light of Christ. God from God, light from light, blessed is God who illumines everyone who comes into the world. And we sing this at our baptisms. But also at the pre-sanctified liturgy, during Great Lent, the priest turns and holds the censer and the candle and faces the congregation and chants, the light of Christ illumineth all. So we all have the potential through Christ to be enlightened and find our way home to him. Unfortunately, humanity, including all of us and myself, are blind to God's light because it is not a light that can be seen with eyes. Rather, it is a light that can only be seen with the heart. As much as we can try within our human rationalism, so we try to rationalize a relationship with God, that will only take us so far. We cannot see God, though, until we truly see God, until we are illumined. And we carry our fantasies, we carry imaginations of who God is, but that is on our terms, which does not make it real. And I know this world doesn't want to hear this, so here's the bad news for the world, but the good news for us. There is one God, one Holy, one Trinity, one Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There's one door, there's one trunk that leads to salvation. And yes, there are many branches, but they are of the same tree. There's one light that can only move in the hearts of men. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. John chapter 1, verse 5. To truly know who God is, to truly experience God, we must first be enlightened by Him and filled with the Holy Spirit. And sometimes we fumble around in our blindness for many years, and we cannot see the truth of God, though, until we are illumined with His light. We cannot say, I'm born again, so it doesn't really matter, so I'm all good to go. So that's it, I've been baptized, that's it, God loves me, I'm good to go. But I would argue and say the Lord told to Nicodemus without question, so it's not open for question or debate, he says amen to you. And when Christ says amen before he teaches something, that means it's not open for discussion or debate. This is how it is. And so this is what our Lord says to Nicodemus, St. Nicodemus, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And that's from John chapter three, verse six. So we cannot just be baptized with water and be born again, but we must also be baptized with fire and keep that fire burning at all times. That is the fire of Christ and the Holy Spirit. That fire burns away the fog that surrounds our human heart to see our shortcomings and to see how to overcome them. So it's one thing to see them. Now that we've seen them, we can either feel bad for ourselves and we should mourn over them, but God doesn't want us to feel bad for ourselves. That's not the point of God shining the light on our sins. It's actually like a physician. We need to diagnose, we need to see what's going on, but we need to get all the other stuff out of the way. We need to put it to the side so we can actually see how to restore you, how to heal you. That's why God shows his light on our sins, not to judge us, but to heal us. And so to, to fully be healed by Christ, not only do we need to see ourselves as I've been persisting on here, but as an Orthodox Christian, we are also called to go that extra mile. So again, not take the path of least resistance. To take that next step towards complete healing in Christ, we truly need to see one another without any judgment, with uh, when we know our brokenness, then we can see the brokenness in others. We can see what's broken in also within the world. What, and then we can also see what the world's hurt is, what is keeping them from taking that next step to drawing closer to Christ. 
when we see this brokenness, we become consumed and we pray. We have divine zeal to help those around us. So we see this brokenness, and again, we can respond in two ways. We can condemn the world and say, I don't want anything to do with it, or we're moved to compassion, and we want to help it. And God ignites that fire in our hearts to go out there, to change it, but to change it for the better through Christ. And rather, so when we begin to see the world, though, through the lens of Christ, and that's what's happening, that when we see the world through the lens of Christ, not our own judgment and condemnation, but with Christ's love and compassion, this will give us an honest diagnosis of how we can be healed by Christ, so that we can become true physicians for others, but also for ourselves through Christ. The only way we can do this for others, though, is to drop our preconceived notions of how we think others should behave and think. Because ultimately, this is how we see our brothers. So if this is how we see our brothers, then ultimately, this is how we see God. And then this is where heresies and false teachings come from. So we need to see ourselves right, we need to see our brothers right, and then we can see God the right way. And if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. We must not hide this light for ourselves or from the world. We must share it, but we first must see it. We must become enlightened through God's grace and become bearers of the light which is within us, which is the light of God. He is the spark that ignites a fire in our minds, hearts, and souls. And St. Gregory of Nyssa, says of God's divinity, if we allow ourselves to become aware of the light of Christ within us and the light of Christ around us, then the world we shall see is illumined through and through as Christ's body was infused through and through with divinity like charcoal in a fire. And then like Saint Seraph on the Sarbo who clearly saw the light of God in his heart, we too will come to see ourselves, our fellow man and all of creation baptized, not with water, but baptized in God's light. And so that's what we pray for. That's what we ask for, is to take away our judgment. Not only to take away our sins, but to take away our preconceived notions of the world and how we think the world should work, but to see it as Christ sees it, to see it as the saints saw it, but see it, not in all the negatives, but see it baptized, baptized in the Holy Spirit. See, Christ even says, he goes, how I wish it was already burning. He was talking of the world. And so what is he talking about? That all of man is reunited to Christ, that they're filled with the Holy Spirit, that we all come back into the harmony that God originally created in, God, in, uh, in the Garden of Adam and Eve, right? Adam and Eve didn't know they were naked until someone told they were naked. Before that, they were in perfect harmony with nature. They experienced God just laid it all bare because they knew they wouldn't be judged. And God still wasn't judging them they actually put the fig leaf on because they started to feel shame. They saw their guilt because they disobeyed God. And God loved them enough to continue to love them and to come to this climax, to be on the cross, to be resurrected. But then what we have to be careful of is not to hold that for ourselves. We have to take that out to the world because the more we share God's love, we share his light, it becomes reciprocal. So we can sit here and have it, but then that oil is just going to get less and less and less. And then eventually we'll be snuffed out. So we have to go out and we have to share that. And the more we do that, we all continue to grow in God's love. So may God be with you. May keep uh, Metropolitan Hilarion uh, as well. May his memory be eternal. And God grant you all grace of the Holy Spirit. Amen.